Welcome to another panel in the Open Data Series, Summer of Open Data Series, where we are exploring the third wave of open data. And today I have another stellar group of people that will share their wisdom and reflections with regard to how do we accelerate the use of open data in a manner that is systematic, sustainable, and uh, responsible. Just as an introduction, the Summer of Open Data is a production by the Open Data Policy Lab, together with the Open Data Institute, the Open Data Charter, Data Gov Hub at Georgetown, and BrightHive as well. And when we uh, use the term the third wave of open data, we are specifically interested in making progress in four areas. The first area is really trying to understand how do we accelerate the use of open data and the sharing of open data at the subnational level. Second area that we are interested in and that we are exploring throughout the summer of open data is how can we also accelerate private sector data being shared in a responsible and sustainable manner with those that could improve their decision making in the public interest. Third area is really about how do we establish a data responsibility framework and set of frameworks to do and accelerate the sharing of open data in a responsible and ethical manner. And then lastly, we are also interested in how do we advance the concept of publish with purpose, where we not only focus on the supply, but also really take into account the, the demand for open data in order to match demand and supply in a better, more superior way than we've had done in some of the earlier waves, perhaps of open data. So with that, uh, let me really uh, let the panel speak. And uh, before we go into the meat of the discussion, I will ask everyone to introduce themselves very briefly. And let's start with Natalia. Natalia, could you briefly introduce yourself and also perhaps uh, uh, indicate your connection with open data? Sure. So hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. I lead on data ethics policy at the Cabinet Office Government Digital Service in the UK. And my link with open data is that I previously advised on open government and open data for the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport in the UK. And I also worked on open data challenges for 360 giving. Great, thank you. Christian. You're muted, Christian. You would think I would have uh, learned by now uh, to, to hit the unmute. Hi, my name is Christian Troncoso. I am Senior Director for Policy at BSA, the Software Alliance. Uh, BSA is an organization uh, that engages with policymakers around the world to uh, help ensure that the policy environment is conducive to the development of uh, software. Our member companies are enterprise-focused organizations that provide uh, B2B cloud services, data analytic solutions, those sorts of things. Um, my focus at BSA is primarily on the intersection of regulation and artificial intelligence. Uh, and increasingly, uh, that bring, has brought me into the, the world of open data. So thanks for having me. Great. Thanks so much, Christian. Zach. Hi, um, Zachary Fader, and, and thanks for having me as well. I oversee the open data program in New York City from the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. And we work in partnership with the city's IT agency and also about 100 agencies and offices um, in every facet of city government. So really, it, it's a network of different people that make this all possible. And in a former life, um, I helped to set up the open data program at the New York City Parks Department. Wonderful. So well, very interested in open data from um, great. the yeah, well, publication side as well. Great. Well, being the open data czar in, uh, uh, in New York, uh, uh, which is now your official title, um, uh, is uh, would love to get your, uh, to start off, uh, we'd love to get your sense on the current state of open data at uh, the city level, uh, both in New York City, but also among your peer uh, cities as well, and uh, and also uh, have a little bit of a, a sense on, um, um, anyway, how is it um, moving forward and, and, and are there any particular kind of challenges that um, or opportunities uh, that you see in the on the horizon? 
Yeah, I think in, in many governments, open data started with a close connection to freedom of information law. Um, and the, the type of data that was made available was very much the type of data that was published through this freedom of information law requests. Um, so, so data that was of interest to journalists, um, data that was of interest to, to lawyers. Um, and over time, we've looked at, and many governments have looked to expand the universe of information that's made available. Um, and, and given the complexities of many of these organizations, I think one of the ways that we've, we've looked to improve, but will continue to look to improve, and a lot of other cities and, and organizations are, are in the same place, is making sure that we are properly identifying the different sources of open data, looking beyond where people are explicitly requesting the data um, and looking at ways the data is housed internally, whether it be data shared between different parts of government, um, data shared to the public with different sorts of tools and maps that are very common now. Um, so, so looking for different, different sources and, and different approaches to identify where this data might exist is, is I think, one, one big way um, that, that we, we have improved, but also have some, some opportunity for growth there. I would say a second is, is thinking beyond the, the, the data itself and realizing, and this is something that, that we, we've, we've realized, but um, again, is something that we'll, we'll continue to work on, that the, the documentation and, and the context of that data is as, as critical for, for data use as, as the provision of the data itself. Da data absent that context is, is not very helpful. And, and one of the, the main things that um, government staff need to do is basically translate the information that they know um, in their, their daily lives, interacting with, producing with, making decisions based on that data to the general public. And then I think the, the last thing I would point to is that translation layer. Um, and, and for some people, you just give them a data set, maybe give them some documentation, and they're off to the races, and then they can use the data and, and, and make good sense of it. But, but for, for most people, um, especially if they're not experts in the particular subject, even with the best documentation, um, th they're just not going to be comfortable interacting with a million rows plus of, of, of tables. Um, so having that the information presented in different ways through different tools, through different dashboards, through maps. Um, as much as we can make that data visual, that, that's something that we really need to do more of or need to continue doing. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And, and I do want to also have you reflect a little bit about, because New York City is kind of uh, unique in the sense is that it does have a legal mandate to uh, open up data. And so we would like to uh, have you a little bit reflect on um, whether this is helpful, <laughs> I, mean, I know I mean, there might be limits in, 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 in your reflection here, uh, but also, anyway, so to what extent is it important to actually have a legal mandate to, as you said, once you have identified data, to really engage in actually making it open in a way that uh, uh, provides both context and, uh, and insight? Yeah, I think to, to your point, the identification and, and just the, the rote publication of the data is really the starting point. And it's only where you get to actual meaningful use and, and reuse um, does, does the data become powerful. Um, and, and with that, the, the, the legal mandate, um, I, I think it, it generally behaves as an important backstop. To, mm -hmm. to the work that is being done to, to expose this, this um, important public data. So it, having something to, to point to that is codified in the law ju just helps to clarify um, what the requirements are, but also frankly helps to set priorities to a certain degree because with this now required by law, it becomes something that people have to pay more attention to. Um, there are many things that government does that are very important and, and crucial and, and the, 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 the making sure that open data receives its, its due um, it, it is one of the effects of, of laws like, like the one we have in New York City. Great, thanks. Um, Let's go to Christian, and Christian has done uh, a lot of thinking about uh, uh, open data, but, but, but also about one uh, level of open data um, that quite often doesn't get uh, as much attention as data at the national or even at the city level, which are, of course, the states and, and in some countries' provinces. 
So tell us a little bit, um, uh, Christian, about your work around states and what your assessment is of open data at that uh, level, but also picking up with uh, what Zach was uh, mentioning with regard to the legal framework. Uh, you've also done some uh, an interesting work on uh, how that might look like at the state level. Yeah, uh, so thanks, Zach, for those great comments. Uh, you know, it, it really is just a, somewhat of a revelation, I think, that people are surprised, may be surprised to learn that, you know, a lot of cities and municipal governments are the ones that are really leading in this space. I think those of us who have been in the open data circles for a while know that, but I think those who are new to the space are a little bit surprised that, you know, New York City, for instance, is way ahead uh, when it comes to this stuff, even compared to the, the federal government. Um, and so I have been doing some research uh, at the state level, and it's, it's really striking how far behind a lot of states are. Uh, although most states at this point, I think 49 at least, have some form of like an open data portal, uh, fewer than uh, 20 states have any sort of formal policy on the books, whether it's an executive order or, you know, legislation. Um, and so I think to your point, uh, it really, I think, gets at the issue of prioritization. Uh, these states that have open data portals, but really have no policy underlying those uh, portals, you, you'll tend to see a portal that is pretty malnourished, not very usable, and not very responsive to the, the community of users who would otherwise uh, engage with the data uh, that's being made available. Um, so my organization, you know, I got experience working on open data legislation over the last few years at the federal level where we were uh, successful in, in helping get the Open Government Data Act signed into law last year after a, a years long effort in partnership with a, a lot of other organizations. Um, so we're hoping to sort of replicate that success uh, on the state level and so are uh, undergoing a process of evaluating sort of what the what states we should focus on um, and so as part of that effort have been doing doing this research just to see what the lay of the land is um, so you know we'll pause there for a second but yeah yeah that's great and um, um, and I also would like uh, Christian if you don't mind um, like to ask me you as the anyway senior policy person at the uh, uh, BSA Software Alliance what, what anyway so what's the What's the value proposition of open data for an association like yours? And, yeah, uh, sure. and, and, and I think, anyway, it might be interesting to understand, anyway, so why is this a high priority uh, uh, within uh, BSA? Yeah, I think that there are a number of reasons. Um, certainly, a lot of the companies we represent are on the leading edge of developing AI. Um, and so access to data is, of course, a huge priority. And there are strategic data sets at the federal level, the, the state level, and the city and municipal level that are really helpful for, for some of those developments. But beyond just developing their own AI systems, um, our, the companies we represent also provide data-enabled services. So the, the return on investment for the products and services they offer their customers uh, is enhanced when their customers have access to more data. So there are like a, a number of levels on which, you know, from a, from a corporate perspective, there's a, a lot of interest in open data. But of course, open data is good for, for a lot of reasons other than just the potential for, for you know, uh, spurring economic growth. You know, there's a transparency interest. I think there are a lot of public interests uh, that are advanced by accessing open data. So. Great, great, thanks. Um, so, Natalia, meaning I know you've done a lot of work on open data, but also, of course, um, quite often um, there, there are valid concerns with regard to how data is being used and being shared. And, and I do feel like uh, the UK has been at the forefront of, uh, especially within government, uh, at the forefront of really thinking about the ethical implications uh, of um, um, using data um, and even sharing data between agencies, which are, I think is kind of an interesting, of course, use of open data. Quite often we forget. Since Natalia, on what are the 
ethical issues associated with the use of data within the government, um, um, data ethics within uh, the UK government. Sure. So first of all, thank you. I'm glad to hear that that you think the UK is uh, is doing quite well on this agenda. That's great. Um, so I would say in general, uh, transparency and open data is at the very, very core of data ethics, because in whatever set of ethical principles uh, that we, we have produced as the government, transparency is always one of the very, very core, very, um, the first, it's one of the first things that you have to think about. Um, however, potential ethical concerns, especially in relation to open data, can come when we're talking about personal data and data privacy issues. So, as, as you mentioned, we're currently refreshing our data ethics framework. And uh, one of the things that, um, that we're putting in there for consideration to our data scientists is how can you demonstrate that the data that you're using has been de-identified to the greatest degree possible? Because the problems arise that if the data set that you're working on or the, or the data set that you've released can be matched with other data sets and that will make individuals easily identifiable. So, so that's a big challenge, I think, and this is something that we need to um, look at when we work with data. And um, in the UK, we have a few ways of dealing with this. So one measure is um, determined intruder testing. So that's using individuals, uh, so-called friendly intruders, to try to see if they can re-identify anyone in, the, in that data set. And um, they don't necessarily need any background knowledge. They are supposed to uh, be similar to, to someone who would potentially be using this data for, uh, for a wrong purpose. So, so that's one of the uh, things that, that, you know, that's at the very, very core of how do we make sure that, sure, we are as transparent as we can, and we do have the open by default policy in the UK, but also how can we make sure that we understand the subtleties of this changing landscape of our open data. And when it comes to data ethics, we currently, I think, yes, we are relatively mature uh, when it comes to having data ethics principles, when it comes to having ethical bodies such as the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. But the kind of challenges that we're facing now is how do we make sure that, that we combine all the principles that we have and give enough guidance and um, to the users and make sure that people in the public sector, but also um, in the private sector, people who are just looking for ethical principles are able to identify the kind of principles that they need the most and that will be the most useful for their particular projects. So procurement, for example, or working in healthcare. And um, another thing, which is something that I've personally been working on, is how do we actually embed those principles in practice? And what are the kind of levers that we can use to ensure that any data project that data ethics is seen as an absolute must and as a natural step, the same way that you would test your model, um, you would also um, make an ethical assessment. So, so that's the second thing. And, um, and the ethical skills, that's, um, that's another challenge and opportunity. So currently we're thinking about how we can make sure that all the public servants working with data have the appropriate skills to understand how to make the most of open data but also how to handle this data ethically. Great, um, very interesting. And, um, and so obviously um, we are having this series uh, uh, not only during the summer, but also during a pandemic uh, that uh, 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 many anyway didn't anticipate would go on for that long and still many don't really, and anyway, most don't really know what will ultimately be the, uh, uh, the evolution. And so how, has data ethics uh, within uh, the UK government um, been perceived during the pandemic? Has this uh, been you know, seen as more important? Has it been featured as uh, we need more uh, data ethic, et ethical practices? So, so what's the impact of COVID-19 on the discussion and the practice of data ethics? So I think the impact has been huge. And, uh, and that's both on data ethics and open data. So in terms of how the public receives data in general, I think that publishing health data about new infections and COVID death rates made everyone 
and I mean absolutely everyone, even the people with the lowest levels of digital inclusion, actually aware of the fact that the government releases open data and that this data is important. So, for example, even my grandma, who doesn't have a laptop, she doesn't have a smartphone. And, you know, when I tried to explain my job in open data and transparency to her last year, she just didn't get it. And suddenly, with all the COVID pandemics information and infection death, um, infection rates and death rates data, suddenly she started to pay real attention to things like what is the data that the government is releasing? So in the case of COVID, that's daily death rates, daily infection rates. Also, what is the methodology behind this data collection? So how COVID-19 deaths are coded if data is collected and released from that particular day or a few days before. Also, whether this data is credible, whether it can be trusted, and whether the data that we're seeing from the government is enough of an explanation for introducing various measures such as lockdown. And um, finally, how this data is reused and shared. And I think that this pandemic has significantly increased the awareness of both open data and data ethics. Because the conversations about ethics made the headlines and you know they they were making headlines every day for quite a good few months now especially when we started talking about the apps and uh, and here was my grandma again asking me about what does it mean centralized versus decentralized app and what is that app about anyway and i think this is a great success because suddenly people who never cared about data, never cared about open data, and aren't even digitally included the way that, that they should be, suddenly they gained this awareness, and that, I believe, gives them more agency. So they have now become more active, more demanding recipients of the government data, and they're ready to hold us accountable. And, and I think this is fantastic, this shift, this, um, this increase in public awareness in of data ethics and open data is key and um, and i do strongly believe and hope that this will change how we work with data and how we share data and uh, no matter if we are in the public or private sector and um, the main thing that this pandemic showed us really is that data ethics is not optional it's not a bonus it's an absolute must if we want to run successful innovative projects for example the COVID app in most countries to be successful, it needs the 60% adoption rate. And this is challenging because if the people who are supposed to use the app don't trust us that we will share and use the data they provide responsibly, they will not download the app. And this is a real, real life, very recent example of how this lack of trust can hinder innovation. And, uh, and I think this is a really key takeaway for all of us that ethics and transparency are at the very, very core. At, they're the backbone of any work with data. Great, very interesting. And, and um, Sank, I, I saw your uh, um, nonverbal uh, reaction while Natalia was talking, so I would love to get your reaction, uh, how that resonates with you in New York City. But also, one element that uh, I think the pandemic has uh, illustrated is also the importance of not just government yeah. data, but also private sector data and finding ways to actually collaborate with the private sector on building a data uh, foundation to uh, inform citizens or uh, extract uh, insight that can help the recovery, for instance. And, and I would love to get your experience uh, on that as well, Zach. Um, yeah, I, I think um, just to start, I want to, to strongly echo and, and agree with what Natalia ended with about data ethics being one of the backbones of, of open data. And um, we, have, we have worked with the, the city's chief privacy officer. And, and similar to the way where we have someone who's responsible for open data in, in the different agencies and offices throughout the city, we also have an equivalent privacy officer. Um, who is, is looks at those ethical concerns in tandem with the, the people who create the data in tandem with the people who publish the data. Um, so really, it, they're, they're all uh, essential parts to, to this, this endeavor and this process. Um, around COVID in particular, we've seen, and I think um, to, to put some numbers in, in a sense to, to what you were both saying about the interest and use, um, we've actually seen record, record traffic to our open data portal. And, and lots of interest in people looking for information about um, COVID-19. And, and, and to that point, um, 
we, we, we've, we've made data available from different government agencies that whether it, it's making more public space available for people to um, recreate responsibly, whether it, it's tracking the, the case rates um, uh, across different communities in New York City, um, or, or whether it's tracking what the government is doing to distribute food, all those government sources um, of data are examples of things that we make available on the city's open data portal. Um, but exactly to, to what you were saying, there, there is a wealth of private data that exists. Um, and, and what we, we started um, a couple of months ago now is this uh, recovery data program where um, taking almost an inversion of open data where instead of government operational data being shared um, for reasons of transparency, for reasons of, of improving and fostering business growth, um, instead of that data being shared out, the, 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 we are now taking data in from companies who do business in New York City, um, from organizations, nonprofits who do business and who operate in New York City, and, and using that to inform recovery. So looking at different sectors, looking at different communities, and making sure we're considering all of that data as we make policies um, around what, whether it's everything from what reopens when, um, to, to, to looking at where, um, where we need extra attention from, from health workers um, and, and, and the city in general. Great. Um, so Christian, I would love to get your um, uh, also reflections on um, both what Natalia and Zach said, but specifically also on the private sector data sharing uh, uh, angle. Uh, you know, I think what uh, New York is doing is, is really a fascinating uh, um, way to engage uh, um, companies that reside or are active within New York City around leveraging their data to inform New York City and improve the citizens uh, and residents of New York City. And so what's um, from me, you being, of course, um, um, dealing with uh, a lot of your members in the private sector, what's your sense uh, of how that is evolving? And, uh, and also, what's the potential role of BSA within that context? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think what we have been, as I mentioned earlier, the, the companies we represent, you know, provide products and services that are enhanced by data. So I think intuitively, they understand the value uh, of open data and ensuring that their customers are able to collaborate around shared data. Um, I think, of course, data is also still a major source of competitive advantages in, in, in many sectors. And so we find ourselves in a pretty interesting moment where companies are beginning to reexamine their corporate strategies to figure out how they can reap the benefits of open data while retaining competitive advantages where sort of proprietary data remains important. Um, in a lot of ways, it reminds me of what we saw in the late 80s and, and 90s uh, with respect to the open source software movement. Um, the open source software movement really picked up steam, steam uh, from smaller entities in the ecosystem who were you know, much more nimble and able to embrace a new cultural approach to software development. And frankly, it took longer for the larger well-established companies to catch on and understand the, the value of open source. So I think that's sort of where we find ourselves now with a, in, at the sort of macro level in terms of how uh, corporations are, are looking at open data. But there are signs that the tide is definitely shifting and I'm seeing a lot, of comp a lot more companies uh, starting to, to dip their toes at least into embracing open data. Uh, even in intensely competitive areas like uh, the automotive industry, where obviously there's a, a huge race underway to, to be the first company that brings to market a fully autonomous vehicle. We're, we're seeing some of the biggest players in that space, Ford uh, and Waymo, have both uh, open sourced major corpuses of, of, of data that they've developed in the hope that sort of spurring cross-industry collaboration will accelerate the pace at which uh, they're able to bring these products to market. And so there's a, a realization that there's a collective problem within the industry that needs to sol be solved. And once that's solved, everyone is going to benefit. And so that's why they're, they're releasing this data. Um, in, in my industry, in the software sector, we're seeing interesting partnerships between you know, fiercely competitive 
a company. So Microsoft and Adobe and SAP just opened, uh, just launched an open data initiative, I think about a year and a half ago. Uh, and the goal is to sort of create the technical infrastructure that's going to make it much easier for their consumers to transfer data, to, to use data across these platforms. And so there, again, a recognition that, you know, even though they're competitors in this space, that there are, you know, benefits that can arise through this sort of co collaboration. So I think the trend lines are all, are all super positive. Um, I think in terms of, you know, what we can do to, to create more incentives for, to, to encourage more private sector sharing of data, um, you know, I think, of course, it's, it's unrealistic to expect corporate companies, corporate uh, corporations to just open their vaults and, and make all of their data available. But I think when there are circumstances where there is a mutual benefit to making data available, we want to make sure that the, that, that the right policy framework is in place so that we're not discouraging them fr from, from doing that. Um, and, you know, Last year, I think last year, MIT did a study with a, a, a few thousand corporate executives on AI and open data related issues. And, you know, one of the striking findings that they reported is that 64% of the, the business executives that they polled are interested in sharing more data, but are, you know, nervous to do so because there's a lack of regulatory certainty as, it, as pertaining to the, the type of data sharing they might be interested in. And so I think there are ways, of course, to overcome these things. You know, one, one thing at BSA that we are interested in, in, in looking into is uh, in the U.S. and I think globally, uh, frankly, is whether we can set up some sort of expedited review process with regulators um, so that they can, you know, give the, the stamp of approval to a, a proposed data sharing arrangement. Um, you think some of the things that get companies worried when it comes to data sharing are sort of both uh, competition uh, concerns um, and also obviously privacy, the privacy implications uh, that can be implicated by uh, data sharing uh, arrangements. Um, I think Beyond just like the policy space, the other thing, I think the other factor that's going to be um, a real catalyst for, for, for more private sector data sharing is the, the development of scalable data sharing tools that's just, that are just going to make it easier and less expensive uh, for organizations to collaborate around shared data. Um, so one, of, one area in particular that we've seen a bunch of progress just in the last year or two uh, pertains to the, the, the development of, of standardized license, data licensing agreements. This sounds super boring, um, but a real impediment to data sharing uh, has been that, you know, the way data is licensed online right now, it, it uses terms that are just, there, there's no standardized terminology. And when, you know, what, when, when a license allows, uh, defines use, it can define it in a way that does not really account for today's modern technologies. Um, so uh, there are uh, several organizations and players that are trying to, to, to help resolve this issue, much as sort of standardized open source licenses were a key to the growth of the open source industry. I think a standardized data licensing agreements may uh, play a similar role here. Uh, Microsoft has been, um, developing a series of model, decent, model license agreements. The Linux Foundation um, has a, a, a new community data license agreement um, that's quite good. Uh, a, a, a few Canadian researchers um, and, and at Element AI um, have created what they're calling the Montreal data license. All of these things do the same thing. I don't think we're ever going to get to a place where there's only one type of data license agreement, but the goal is to have tools out there for companies that don't have giant legal departments to make it easy for them to, 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 to license data in ways that, you know, is predict that provides predictability for them. And so I think standardized data licensing agreements are going to be key. And then I think the other, from a technical side, uh, the continued innovation around data sharing platform technologies is going to be a, play a big role here too. 
Um, you know, there have been tremendous advances in, in differential privacy and, and federated machine learning, which are technologies, you know, we could have a whole separate uh, webinar on this, these, these technologies, but essentially what they do is allow for organizations to, to, to collaborate around data without actually exposing the data itself. Um, and so, you know, Intel has recently, for instance, launched a, a federated machine learning platform uh, and th th they are piloting it with 30 uh, research hospitals who are jointly developing an AI system that's going to help radiologists detect early stage brain tumors. This type of research has been inhibited in the past because of privacy, uh, health privacy laws that make it very difficult to share um, any health records, but through the use of federated learning, uh, these research institutions are able to bring their corpus of data to the table without actually handing the data over uh, to the other hospitals. So essentially, the the the, the algorithm is trained. The, the algorithm goes to the individual corpus of data to, to get trained, rather than bringing the data. Uh, to, to one centralized location. Uh, Microsoft and Harvard are, are co-developing a, a similar platform that uh, relies on differential privacy to achieve uh, a, a similar results. So I'm really optimistic that, you know, the, the, these technological developments, um, these tools like data sharing agreements, um, and then just the, the cultural shift that is happening within companies. Collectively, these things are all leading in a direction where uh, I think there's just going to be a lot more data sharing uh, in the future. Um, so, yeah. Great, Christian. Well, you gave us a, a really good uh, uh, overview of uh, where we can, anyway, where progress is made, and also if we get this right, where we can actually accelerate this third wave. And, and really interested in also your open data licensing. We actually are working on. Uh, developing a taxonomy of licensing to also because indeed, as you said, there's not going to be one uh, license that is going to uh, uh, become the standard. Uh, but I think just already understanding what is the taxonomy of licensing uh, and what might be fit for purpose uh, for your purpose uh, uh, seems to be uh, missing. And so we are working on that as well. So I think. Zach, Christian has given us like uh, a real good agenda here. Um, anyway, if we would make progress here. So if I would give you the magic wand, uh, and uh, not only I will give that to you as well in a second, um, what would be your um, priorities um, in order to accelerate uh, the third wave of open data, or at least make your life uh, um, perhaps easier or uh, more impactful? Yeah, one of the things that we started when we were thinking about this recovery data partnership to both encourage um, businesses to share, and again, organizations of all, all varieties to share data with us, um, but also to make sure that we are being as transparent as possible with the public about this data is to, to make sure that in addition to using the data, and this is city staff, city data scientists, city analysts, um, policy experts using this data internally, but when we when we do so to to share the use cases So to kind of have a product that comes out of it um, Which both fosters more interest in the program just since we've launched it We've had other organizations come to us to look to join um, But also just communicates to the public that this is how the data is being used and, and, and kind of helps to assuage some concerns um, from these organizations of, of what might the impact be um, from a competitive stance on, on sharing this information with government. So I think it really as much as possible tying data sharing back to uses, which both grounds it for people who may not be as interested in the data itself. I think that Talia, your example about your grandmother and the, the COVID-19 data where you take a topic someone's interested in, all of a sudden the data becomes more interesting. Um, it is really fundamental to the continued growth of open data, but also the continued success of data sharing. Great, yeah, and, and it reminds me of this uh, great campaign that you've held, um, I think last year or a few years ago, I can't remember, which was like similar to what you saw in the um, subway where quite often you see like signs, which was then, you know, this, this film was made in New York City. 
that uh, uh, you did a similar kind of thing, which was around powered by New York City Open Data, which I thought was a really interesting campaign to actually uh, socialize um, uh, the use of open data uh, more broadly. And I think we should definitely see more of that. Uh, uh, so, yeah. I, I was about to say that keep your eye out because we will definitely be having more of that. Cool, so. cool, cool. Great, great. Natalia, uh, you have the last word. I mean, I could go on here for the rest of the day with, uh, with the three of you uh, because uh, you, you bring such a uh, immense wealth of insight and expertise to the table. But uh, I give you the last word to reflect on if you would have a magic wand or a genie somewhere and you can make a wish, uh, uh, what would be your um, priority wish, uh, knowing that you can only make one, for instance? So uh, how would you go about this, Natalia? I um, I have more than one. I'm sorry, but <laughs> first I'd like to echo what, uh, what Zachary just said about impact stories and case studies on both um, data ethics and open data because I think that's absolutely essential for for the understanding of why we need those policies. Also, simple explanations of the long term value of open data that resonates with you know, policymakers and decision makers that don't necessarily fully understand what we're talking about. And um, I would also say more deliberation and participation in this space. So increasing public participation and deliberative, uh, deliberative processes, um, running citizen assemblies on data ethics or on data, um, on open data. That's, that's absolutely something that I would like to see. And um, the OECD developed a fantastic report on deliberative practices. And um, we, we also, we made a, quick and easy tool for policymakers to help them increase participation and transparency of their work. And um, finally, I would also say, and um, these are all uh, similar points, that's why I'm, I'm giving you more than one wish, but, uh, but also feedback mechanisms that are embedded in, um, in open data platforms and uh, also in data ethics principles. So when you have someone who's using our data ethics framework, for example, what I would love for them to do is to then send us a case study of their use and also give us feedback, whether the way that it's written resonates, whether they found it helpful, whether they think that these are the, the things are, we are asking for are appropriate. So I'd say more communication with the users and more dialogue with the public. Wonderful. Great. Well, if we would have had more time, uh, uh, I would have asked Zach also uh, around um, some of the work we've done together with regard to the data assembly, which was actually a citizen assembly around data in New York City. But unfortunately, we've run out of time and I do want to also leave people with a teaser for more. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to close this wonderful conversation. Thank, uh, thanks a lot, Natalia, Zach and Christian for sharing your wisdom. Uh, I've learned a lot and uh, looking forward to stay engaged and above all, stay safe. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Andrew is supposed to now switch off the recording and, that, and then we can do the real talking. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, I still...